<clears throat> okay, now it's good. I don't know, that chair is not very good. I will now call to order the October 28, 2021 Clackamas County Board of Commissioners Business Meeting. Gary Schmidt, please call the poll. Thank you, Chair Smith. First, our staff support today, Mary Bork, Clerk to the Board, Stephen Madcor, County Council. Roll call, Commissioner Schull. Here. Commissioner Savas. Here. Commissioner Schrader. Here. Commissioner Fisher. Here. Chair Smith. Here. Thank you. I will now lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. We are holding this meeting in person and virtually. If you've joined us via Zoom for this meeting and are interested in providing public comment, we will prompt you regarding how to do that when the time is right. General public comment will be taken at the usual allotted time. As always, the public is welcome to sign up to testify. Registration for public comment closes at five minutes past 10. I would like to remind all participants, including staff, all elected officials, and members of the public that Robert's Rules of Orders will be enforced during this business meeting. We welcome your opinions and look forward to your polite participation. Gary, can you introduce the first item? Yes, Chair. Our first item is COVID-19 updates. Philip Mason Joyner, Public Health Director, will present. He is on Zoom. We'll join him here in just a moment. Good morning, Chair Smith and Commissioners. Glad to join you this morning to provide the weekly COVID-19 update. And Mary, if you could please start the slides. Thank you very much, looks great. Um, next slide please, I'll provide the weekly case data update as usual. In Clackamas County in the past week, we've had a little over 600 uh, cases and sadly five deaths. Multnomah County had close to 817 deaths and Washington County had uh, 681 and eight deaths. Um, in terms of a statewide picture, the state of Oregon currently has, has since the start of the pandemic, 362,000 cases and about 4,300 deaths statewide. Next slide, please. The positive news is that our case count week by week uh, is doing a gradual decline. Much slower than we would like, but it is nice to see it starting to move downward um, in the right direction. Hospitalizations across the region for COVID positive patients are also down. However, as you all are well aware, hospital capacity um, and our, our uh, healthcare workers still continue to be quite busy um, with all the needs across the community to provide health services. Next slide, please. Last Friday, uh, some good news that Moderna and Johnson & Johnson joined Pfizer in being authorized to provide boosters for um, individuals who receive their initial, uh, initial doses and are over the age of 65, have an underlying health condition, or um, a general category, category of being, um, having a job where you're at higher risk of exposure to COVID-19, uh, such as providing services to the general public. Um, we are also authorized now to provide mix and match doses. So if you receive the Moderna vaccine, you could also receive uh, the Pfizer as a booster, for example. We are anxiously awaiting um, for the authorization to provide vaccinations for young people ages five to 12. Um, and we're anticipating that announcement anytime soon. We've been working really closely with our 10 local school districts. We have plans in place ready in early November, as soon as that announcement comes to begin um, providing uh, pediatric vaccines in, in a kid-friendly environment. And then we have heard from our federal partners that there'll be information uh, after that early 2022 around guidance for um, 
for children under the age of five years old. Next slide, please. Uh, we continue to provide local clinics around the county. I really wanna encourage folks to visit our Clackamas County COVID-19 webpage. Lots of information on regular appointments if you haven't received your first dose yet or if you're looking to receive a booster shot. We had a really successful clinic yesterday at the Clackamas Town Center in the mall. Um, close to 300 shots were provided. Uh, over 6,000 doses have been provided in the past week here in Clackamas County. We're currently at a vaccination rate um, for individuals 18 and older at a little over 75%. The state of Oregon is at 77% right now. So making some progress. And the final slide for today is really wanna thank our public and government <laughs> affairs department. They have um, created a photo contest in celebration of Halloween this weekend. So we want to encourage folks to head on over to Clackamas County social media pages, um, share a photo of how you are um, being creative and have some fun about how you're celebrating Halloween uh, this weekend. And uh, if you do, you could win a $25 gift card. So something a little bit fun uh, to engage in with us this weekend. That's the information I have this week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. Any comments or questions for the presenter? Commissioner Fisher. Thank you, Chair Smith. Philip, you disappeared. Um, I don't know. Are you still there? I'm here. Yes. Okay. I was um, wondering when we look at the graph that has the cases and that they're coming down, how far down on that graph do they need to get to for when we will see a easing of the uh, mandatory mask requirements? Uh, the case rates have gone down. We're still, if you remember back to the previous framework, uh, we're still in that high risk category in Clackamas County. So we have a ways to go until we enter those lower risk levels. Um, if you're looking at the graph, it's really when earlier this summer, when when there's that, that notation there that Oregon reopened, um, that, that would put us at that lower risk level where I imagine the state at, if, if that were generally where the state is, I imagine that some of the mass requirements would be lifted, but I can't say that for certain, but that would be my best educated guess. Okay, do you have an educated guess as to if the cases continue to decline at the rate that they've been declining about how long that will take? Um, OHSU last week released the forecast. Uh, the projection is the end of the calendar year. Um, and that is in our weekly board report. Really want to encourage the public and partners to take a look at that really, really good information about um, what the current projections look like. Excellent. Another question I have is I've been talking with some members of our community parents who are really wanting the uh, schools to adopt a test to stay process, which could reduce quarantine times of children exposed to COVID. I know that the Department of Education, OPB, did a pretty significant um, article about talking about that with Colt Gill explaining different aspects of that. Can you give us an idea of if that will be implemented and if so, how that will roll out here in Clackamas County? Yeah, for weeks we continue. I know the local health departments around the state continue to advocate with the Oregon Health Authority around this concept. Um, they are actively working on it. Um, it will require additional federal testing to be of uh, I, additional testing uh, supplies to be available for our local schools in order to implement that well. Um, our schools will need additional staffing support in order to implement that. Um, it's actively being worked on. We've heard that in November we're anticipating more federal supplies of testing uh, materials, so that'll help. I'm hopeful that. Um, the state of Oregon, we can we can get there in the weeks and months to come. Okay, is there would it be helpful at all for our commission to get better educated on that issue and to maybe send a letter? I don't know if it would go to the governor or to the Oregon Health Authority. Would that would that type of advocacy from a governing body be helpful? I mean, I might I do the president. We might have to say to the president of the United States, we need more testing supplies so our children can remain in school. I don't know uh, what would be helpful. I suppose I would say the Oregon Health Authority are, do, are 
actively working on this issue. I, I don't think there's any issue at all at um, communicating okay. um, so, our voices to express the need. They're well aware, but it, uh, certainly there's no harm. In okay, and everybody's on the same page that this would be a good way to keep kids in school. There isn't any um, controversy about that. Correct. Oh, excellent. Well, that's good. Then we will just continue to um, keep our eyes on, on that issue. Thank you, Philip. Yeah, we have another commissioner in the queue, but Commissioner Fisher, to piggyback on something that you said <clears throat> that I thought of, Philip, she asked about when you know, the mask mandate would be lifted and how low cases have to go. What about herd immunity? I've been hearing a lot from health officials. Herd immunity should be kicking in by the end of the year, and would that necessitate uh, alleviating the mask mandate? Yeah, it, the OHSU forecast points to that as well. It's, um, you know, I provide the vaccine rates for ages 18 and older. When in a couple of weeks ago, I did share the entire population. Um, that was, we're still in the 60% or so. So we have a little bit ways to go here locally in Clackamas County and the state. Um, but the projections, you know, Especially with the uptick we've seen in the past few weeks of vaccinations, I certainly think we're headed in a good direction. Okay, thank you for that, Philip. Commissioner Savas, you're up. Yeah, um, Philip, um, I, I think there was a, um, the way it was presented today, and tell me if I'm wrong, but um, it's, nice, it's encouraging that the cases have gone down since July, but um, as I mentioned before, I, I look at the daily counts and I review the numbers every day. And what I'm seeing is uh, has been pretty flat here for the last week or two. And actually, you, someone could actually derive maybe that it might be starting to creep back up. And I know that areas around the country with colder climates, people being more indoors than before, um, that seems to be a pattern developing. So um, could, could you speak to that or validate that? <clears throat> Yeah, the, the forecasts are looking like it's a jagged decline, so you're going to see weeks where it fluctuates a little bit. A couple of weeks ago, we actually had a really slight increase, and now we're down. So it's going to be a jagged decline um, is what we're seeing. And I do think you're right. It's cold and flu season. Um, COVID is still spreading in the community. Um, there continues to be the risk there. Um, but, but the data is the data right now. I would say in general, it's looking positive or headed in the right direction. I hope it can continue. Right, and, and my, uh, my second question is, and I know it's not necessarily your wheelhouse um, for the county per se, um, but um, is the discretion the school districts have that much more unique than perhaps the county has or any other jurisdiction? In what regards, Commissioner? Well, as far as the mask requirements or testing requirements or alternatives, I mean, I, I just, I just was under the impression that the the uh, discretion that we have, as far as um, you know, requiring mask you know 100% or vaccines 100% and so on, and obviously schools can't do that because there's no vaccine available for kids that are under 12. So, um, but I'm just kind of concerned. I'm just kind of my question is is that is is the discretion unique for the school districts in any which way? Do they have more or less leverage to um, in implement or, or um, any other in the uh, requirements? Um, they have a lot of precautions, plans in place and requirements from the Oregon Department of Education um, around COVID protocols. Um, at this point, there's no vaccine requirements for youth. Uh, the masking is pretty significant when they're, they're in the classroom for, for certain. So I don't know if I'm answering the question fully. Um, yeah, well, maybe we can just talk offline or I can send you an email yeah, offline and, and see if I can't get, you know, more detailed and just drill down to my question. It, it was back towards discretion. You know, what what do the bodies, you know, the board of county commissioners or, you know, the parks district or, you know, the school district or any of the districts, um, all these different jurisdictions, you know, do they have different varying amounts of discretion that are unique from one another? Good question. Yeah, but say in general, school board, it's very similar to Board of County Commissioners. School boards have to follow the state law. Um, they can do more restrictive, put more restrictions in place, but they can't be less restrictive than the state guidance. Okay, thank you. Directives. I uh, see no other comments. Thank you very much, Philip, for oh, uh, providing Chair that Smith. today. Chair Smith? Yes. 
Sorry, Phil, I have one other question. Please be brief. Yes, of course. Um, Philip, I'm curious about the, your report touches on it, about the federal requirements for the employers over 100 and that how that the rules are being developed now. Do you have a timeline on when those rules will go into effect? I do not. There has been very limited information coming out about that, and we're all anxiously awaiting that information. It could be any time now. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Philip. On to the next item. I will now recess as the Board of County Commissioners and convene as a Housing Authority Board. Gary, would you introduce the first item? Yes, Chair Smith. Uh, first, uh, Mary, would you please bring in Ann Leinstra, Housing Commissioner, into the Zoom room? Commissioner Leinstra is there. Very good. Uh, welcome, Commissioner Leinstra. Uh, this is the Housing Authority Consent Agenda. Mary, would you please read the Consent Agenda? Number one, approval to execute a contract between Housing Authority of Clackamas County and Impact Northwest to provide supportive housing case management and housing navigation and placement. Contract value not to exceed $267,225. Funded through supportive housing services program funds. No county general funds are involved. Number two, approval of a three-year lease of the HACC-owned office space at 146 Malala Avenue, Oregon City, to Central City Concern for the administration of the LEAD program in Clackamas County, generating lease revenue of $5,400 annually with an annual increase of 3%. No county general funds are involved. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I'll entertain a motion at this time. Commissioner Lindstra. I have moved we approve the Housing Authority consent agenda as written. Second. Uh, Commissioner Leinstra has moved for the approval of the Housing Authority Consent Agenda, seconded by Commissioner Fisher. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, Mary, please call the poll. Commissioner Leinstra. Aye. Commissioner Savas. Aye. Commissioner Fisher. Aye. Commissioner Schull. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Chair Smith. Aye. The motion is approved 6-0. Thank you, Ann Leinstra, for showing up on this item. Thank you. I will now adjourn as a housing authority and reconvene as a board of county commissioners. Gary, what's up next? Uh, next, Chair Smith, is the regular consent agenda. Mary, would you please read the consent agenda? Yes, here we are. And let me get it up on Zoom. Slowly go through here. Okay, so we've just finished the housing. Under consent agenda item A, elected officials, these are approval of the previous business minutes, meeting minutes. Under B, housing, health, housing, and human services, number one, approval of amendment number three to subrecipient agreement with Cascadia Behavioral Health, Inc. for residential treatment services. Amendment extends the term of the agreement to December 31st, 2021 with no change to agreement cost. No county general funds are involved. Number two, approval of change order number six between Clackamas County and Ankrum Mosian Associated Architects, Inc. for the Sandy Health Clinic project. This change order adds $21,534.64. New total contract value is $314,785.64, funded through the Health Center's fund balance. No county general funds are involved. Number three, approval to accept funding from Oregon School-Based Health Alliance for School-Based Health Center program funds. Funding agreement is for $8,000. No county general funds are involved. Number four, approval to apply for the University of Baltimore combating overdose through community level intervention to expand Project HOPE. Maximum grant awards $300,000. No county general funds are involved. Under C, technological, technology services, number one. Approval of a contract with CenturyLink Communications, LLC, to establish an updated master service agreement for ex external connections to the public telecommunications network and enhanced services in all Clackamas County buildings and offices. Total contract value is $840,000 funded through direct billings to departments, some of which are funded through county general funds and external agency billings. Number, under D, finance, number one, 
approval of public improvement contract with L R L Reimer Company for the secure parking lot expansion project at the central utility plant. Total contract value is $319,225, funded through county general funds. Scroll down a little bit here. Number Under E, business and community services, number one. Approval of contract amendment three between Clackamas County and Oregon City Chamber of Commerce to provide business recovery center services in support of the local business community impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Amendment number three adds $50,000 for a new co total contract value of $155,026. Funded through Oregon State Lottery Funds. No county general funds are involved. Number two, approval of a contract amendment number three between Clackamas County and Sandy Area Chamber of Commerce to provide business recovery ser center services in support of the local business community impacted by COVID-19 pandemic. Amendment number three adds $50,000 for a new total contract value of $152,320. Funded through Oregon State Lottery Funds. No county general funds are involved. Scroll down a little bit. My glasses are fogging up. Number three, approval of contract amendment three between Clackamas County and Canby Area Chamber of Commerce to provide business recovery center services in support of the local business community impact of the impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Amendment three adds $50,000 for a new total contract value of $162,366. Funded through Oregon State Lottery Funds. No county general funds are, in, are involved. Number four, approve, approval of contract amendment number three between Clackamas County and Lake Oswego Chamber of Commerce to provide business recovery center services in support of the local business community impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Amendment number three adds $50,000 for a new contract value of $163,520. Funded through Oregon State Lottery Funds. No county general funds are involved. Number five, Approval of contract amendment number four between Clackamas County and North Clackamas County Chamber of Commerce to provide business recovery center services in support of the local business community, business community impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Amendment number four adds $50,000 for a new total contract value of $193,145. Funded through Oregon State Lottery Funds. No county general funds are involved. Under number six, approval of the sale and transfer of a remnant parcel of county property adjacent to Southwest Frog Pond Lane to Donnie L. Martin for $1,000. No, no county general funds are involved. Four, I'm sorry, F, disaster management. Number one, approval of a contract with Ashbrit INC for on-call disaster debris removal and disposal services. As an on-call disaster response contract, funding is not identified in advance. General funds may be used, but will be identified and approved by the board as needed. Number two, approval of amendment number one to the State Homeland Security Grant Agreement number 19-214 between Clackamas County and the State of Oregon for three shelter trailers. Amendment number one extends the duration of the existing agreement to July 31st, 2022. Total agreement value remains $36,300 funded through the Oregon Office of Emergency Management. No county general funds are involved. Under G, Transportation and Development, number one, Approval of an annual intergovernmental agreement with Metro to implement the FY21-2022 annual waste reduction and recycle at work program. This will provide $506,422 in funding to the county for fiscal year 2020-2021. No county general funds are involved. Number two, approval of the second amendment to an intergovernmental agreement for provisions of permitting process and building and inspection plan review services. Clackamas County Building Code Division rate pays a rate of $57.89 per hour for work performed by the City of Beaverton, and the total contract amount is based on the hours worked during the time frame of this agreement. Funding is through revenues from fees for permitting and plan reviews. No county general funds are involved. Under number three, approval num of amendment number four with David Evans and Associates, Inc., for the South End Road at milepost 3.8, amendment number four adds $366,982.82 for a new total of $996,024.29 with funding through the Federal Emergency Relief Funds, which is $329,293.68 and a County Road Match Fund of 10.27%. Sorry, let me say that again. And a County road match fund of 20, 20, 10, 10 
I can't even see. <laughs> Let me, I'm going to say that again. 10.27%, which is $37,689.14. No county general funds are involved. Thank you very much for that, Mary. <clears throat> there have been longer consent agendas, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, does any commissioner wish to remove any item from this consent agenda? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. I move. I move approval of the consent agenda. Seconded. Commissioner Schrader has moved for approval of the consent agenda. Commissioner Scholl has seconded the motion. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mary, would you please call the poll? Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner Savas. Aye. Commissioner Sch Fisher. Aye. Commissioner Schull. Aye. Chair Smith. Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you very much for that. I will now recess as the Board of County Commissioners and convene as a Water Environment Services. Gary. Uh, next is the Consent Agenda for Water Environment Services. Mary, will you please read the Consent Agenda? Yes. Number one, approval of contract amendment number two between Water Environment Services and OTEC Inc. for the Water Environment Services and Happy Valley Storm System Master Plan. Amendment number two adds $215,602 for targeted basin planning and expanded capital improvement plan development. New contract total is $692,601 funded through West Service Water Operating Funds. No county general funds are involved. Thank you. Does any commissioner wish to remove any items from this consent agenda? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. I move for approval of the Water Environment Services Consent Agenda. Second. Commissioner Scholl has moved for the approval of the Water Environment Services Consent Agenda, and Commissioner Schrader has seconded that motion. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mary, please call the poll. Commissioner Fisher. Aye. Commissioner Scholl. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner Savas. Aye. Chair Smith. Aye. The motion has been approved. I will now adjourn as a Water Environment Services and reconvene as a Board of County Commissioners. Up next is public communication. This portion of the agenda shall be limited to items of county business which are properly the object of board consideration and should be nonpartisan in nature, as the BCC is a nonpartisan governing body under Oregon Revised Statutes and County Code. Testimony is limited to three minutes. Comments shall be respectful and courteous to all. As a reminder, you can email submissions for public communication at bcc at clackamas.us, and these will be accepted as part of the public record. However, we will not be reading them at the business meeting due to time constraints. I will now open the meeting for public testimony. As always, I take in-person testimony first. We have two blue cards. First up is Elvis Clark. Please come forward, state your name, area of residence, and you have three minutes. Hello, commissioners and chair. Um, I'm Elvis Clark. I live in Milwaukee and uh, Ardenwell neighborhood. And uh, I sent written testimony uh, to you earlier the week about, about the Oak Lodge governance uh, study that was released recently. And um, it does the members of the Oak Lodge Governance Project want to say that it shows that the incorporation in that or annexation of um, the Oak Grove of Jennings Lodge area would be feasible, but there's also reasons, reasons in the study that many uh, residents wouldn't want to incorporate, and those who are, are um, the property taxes would increase pretty significantly in for them in either incorporating as a city itself or um, being annexed into this uh, city of Milwaukee. And um, there's other reasons outside the study which are not raised, and that is that city governments, as you probably well know, have a propensity for their city councils to layer on new rules and regulations that are burdens on the their citizenry, and that's a tendency I've witnessed in Milwaukee. But also, my Oak Grove friends also recognize that um, tendency for city councils, a handful of 
uh, people in the community that a lot of people don't even know their names and recognize their faces at the store. And anyways, there's a tendency to layer on these extra burdens. And so uh, my friend, Oko friend, uh, Kathy Najak, sent you an email earlier today about why she likes her community, Oak Grove, and why she opposes being incorporated. And it, a lot of it has to do with the ease of the um, commuting in the area. So it imp impacts land use stuff that, even though the, a lot of the members of the, or the number of members at the Oak Lodge Governance Project see the parking spaces as kind of like blight, to other people there, the ease of commuting to the shops that are on the corridor, the McLaughlin corridor, is why they like the being unincorporated and so they don't get this uh, wave of uh, five-story block size uh, buildings all along the corridor there. And uh, they just see it as a, a, a opportunity for developers to take over the city and and um, and push these new um, developments and overwhelm the existing residents with uh, congestion and higher costs of living. Anyway, so there's a demand for the county to continue serving these unincorporated areas and a large a segment of the population, like 40% or more, like to be in unincorporated cities and um, they also can have communities even if they're not have it layered on with a city government. Thank you. Thank you very much. Up next is Les Poole. Please come forward, state your name, area of residence, and you have three minutes. I see we have the sunken chair. <laughs> uh, it's all right, it works. I'm used to it at home. You look fine. Uh, my name's Les Poole, and of course I live here in the county, specifically in Gladstone. Um, i got a few quick subjects, uh, one of which is I participated in a Zoom meeting last night, the Beaver Creek Hamlet, and uh, um, there was a presentation by Mike Besner from our transportation department and I was there for another issue. And just some feedback, there's a lot of concerns about the overburdening and overloading of the, of the highways and traffic and, and the, the usual things we're hearing about. And uh, uh, Chair Tam and the others are, are working real hard there. Um, I'm uh, sure that they'll be interested in our tolling measure that is going through a process right now that would require a vote on tolling because we're gonna see people going out Highway 213 rather than be charged to use the existing lanes on 205. Um, I wanna thank everyone that's encouraged me to run for public office. I've got a couple of options. I've got the right resume. And these are tough times, uh, very difficult times, and a tough time to be an elected official. It's probably, uh, the toughest time we've ever had. And the decisions that are made and how money is spent are going to have a dramatic impact on our future. Um, regarding vaccines, um, I'm not anti-vax, but I have concerns about over-reliance on vaccines for rapidly mutating diseases diseases that are not stable. I have concerns about some of the cross-mixing of different doses and the viability of the vaccines that we're getting because they really aren't conventional vaccines. So while there's a lot of exuberance to get everyone vaccinated, vaccines or the current, uh, the current capability is not a panacea. And um, I'm deeply troubled that there's been a absolute dictatorial approach by Governor Brown through her executive powers and the state. It's very unreasonable. There are folks in this room 
that couldn't take the vaccine. And here we are firing government employees and hearing from the governor now that we have a 100% public vaccination rate. I'll close by saying if I were one of the three commissioners who voted to table the support resolution for federal or state and government workers, I'd put it back on the Thank you agenda very much. today. Sorry, I went three minutes and three seconds. I try. Yep, you do. Um, that's all the in-person testimony I have here today, Mary. Who do we have online? Thanks, Chair. We have three uh, people signed up for today. First, we're going to start with Angela Nyland. Let me get her in. Angela, can you hear us? Angela, are you, can you hear us? We had trouble last week. Yes, too. she's listed as mute. Angela, can you please unmute yourself? Unmute. There we are, Did it Angela. Work this time? Okay. You can hear me? Yes, thank you. Angela, can you please state your name and area of residence, and then you have three minutes? Sure. Angela Nyland, Boring, Oregon. Um, I wanted to follow up on the discussion of the board rules. Um, on April 13th of this year, the board met to discuss uh, Robert's Rules of Orders, or Robert's Rule of Order, and there was also a discussion on bylaws. Um, I, Mr. Mackler did a wonderful job of sharing, you know, Robert's Rules of Order is 687 pages. It's cumbersome, archaic. Um, there was discussion of a light version. Um, so a lighter version, if I understood him correctly, would not get in the way of a process getting completed. Um, he said, if I understood him correctly, the county this size with a budget this size and projects this size, we are an outlier by not having rules and bylaws. Um, having those creates a good process, formality, and expectations. We expect our ABCs to have bylaws. Um, a draft was shared with the commissioners. And I don't know what the name of the draft was because it was in a policy meeting type setting, so it, there wasn't any packet that I could access. Um, but a draft was shared, and the commissioners were going to do their markups and return them to Gary and Mr. Madcore. For, um, to compile into a new document to be reviewed. Um, commissioners, it, it seemed on that call that um, a majority of the commissioners all supported this idea for, for having rules for the board. And however, at that time, the budget was a priority. So this was moved to summer after the budget was done. So after the last call I was listening to, I believe it's a policy session, um, it seems that the rules are not a priority at this time. So um, what I wanted to confirm is, is this is now being pushed to 2022. And my other question is, I haven't found documentation that there was a motion and a vote to use a light version of Robert's Rules of Order or a, um, what was the other one, Sturgis Light, um, because, you know, I want to make sure I'm looking at the right documentation. So did we move to a Sturgis light or was it voted on to move to Robert's light? And if it is, where can I find it? And thank you for all the commissioners who replied to me personally via by phone or by email. I appreciate it. And that's all I have today. Thank you. Uh, our county council is here. And uh, Stephen, would you like to address this? We certainly can send the um speaker a copy of a current copy of the draft board rules we have i circulated those to the full board this week and i can certainly feel free to do that the board has not adopted sturgis rules or procedure and um or anything else mm -hmm. we're still abiding by robert's rules um stephen we have um, a county code that was approved by voters you want to explain that we do have a county code. It sets forth that we have five commissioners. They're nonpartisan. There is a chair. The chair sets the agenda and presides over board meetings. Thank you very much. Mary, who's up next? Next, we have Chris Waller. Let me get Chris here. Chris. 
Chris, can you hear us? Please unmute yourself. Chris Waller, Jennings Lodge. I also wanted to point out, it looks like you made me a panelist instead of a speaker. Yeah, thank you. I was noticing that. What? All right. So we're just wanted to make sure I'm okay with continuing and you don't yes, need to please. fix that first. All right. I was shocked to hear Chair Smith state at this Tuesday's meeting that she wishes to reinstate Commissioner Schultz's liaison duties and reverse the censures against him by the end of this year. Doing so would be a huge slap in the face to so many people in this county who have been harmed by his actions. Commissioner Schall has not shown that he has changed or that he understands what he has done. Instead, at every opportunity, he has been given to show remorse for his actions or to demonstrate that he understands how he has harmed others in our community, he has adamantly refused to do so. Again and again, he has attempted to justify his actions or to blame them on others rather than admitting, yes, I was wrong, I hurt others with my poor choices, I understand that I was fully responsible for my behavior and I am taking steps to change and so these incidents do not happen again. And more to the point, he has repeated the same behaviors that got him in hot water back in January over and over again. Do we really need a list comparing public health regulations to Jim Crow, comparing vaccine requirements to the Holocaust, supporting hordes of unmasked protesters descending upon this meeting spewing blatantly false propaganda, having community organizations have to demand that he remove pictures of their clients on Facebook that were taken without their permission? These blatant incidents of absolute blindness to the effects of his own actions and self-righteous insistence that he is perfectly correct and everyone around him who is appalled by his behavior is wrong are ample demonstrations that nothing has changed. Unfortunately, as county council pointed out, you cannot yourselves remove Commissioner Schull from his position no matter how egregious his behavior, so we're working on doing that for you. But in any private employment position, he would have been fired long ago with cause. But what you can do is uphold the positions you've already taken. What Commissioner Schull did was wrong when he did it and is still wrong now. As long as he refuses to accept the harm he has caused and to take serious demonstrated steps to change his own behavior rather than blaming others around him, and as long as he continues to espouse bizarre and intolerant beliefs, removing the censure is simply enabling, excusing, and reinforcing his abysmal actions. Commissioner Schull's behavior should never be normalized. What he did was wrong and remains wrong, and you as commissioners owe it to the citizens of this county to continue taking what he did seriously, holding him accountable for it, and working to make sure it never happens again. If you excuse his behavior and pretend it never happened or it will not happen again, you become complicit in it. Thank you. Mary, who's up next? Chair, we have Christine Kennedy. Give me a moment here. Let me get her pulled up. Okay. Christine, can you hear us? I can. Can you okay. hear me? Yes, we can. Um, if you could, just here in just a moment, let me get this stopped. Please state your name for the record in your area of residence. Thank you. My name is Christine Kennedy. I live in Lake Oswego, and I've lived in Clackamas County for seven years, and I'm anxiously awaiting my county property tax bill. Commissioners, I remember January 7th, 2021, the day after the attempted insurrection at the U.S. Capitol and my first testimony to the Board of County Commissioners for Clackamas County. There were about four of us who called to voice our concerns with Chair Smith's aggressive plan to reopen Oregon. I also distinctly remember how I felt after Mark Schull's unhelpful and over solicitous advice to those speaking to sit back and relax because he had so much confidence in Ms. Smith's ability to lead us through the recovery. There was no acknowledgement of the concerns voice, no compassion voice. The hair on the back of my neck literally went up and I thought, who is this man? Sadly, we have seen division and distraction over these issues continue. Anger and anxiety seem to go hand in hand. And still again today, we he heard misinformation from Les Pool. We are all tired of this pandemic. In July, the Delta variant came back to really increase spread. Well, actually it increased, increased the spread. And we all had to go back, step back. 
We had increasing cases, increasing deaths. I deeply appreciate Philip Mason Joiners being available for briefings every week. It's essential we hear from him. This week, we had five more deaths. My condolences go to the families and people who are impacted by this. Cases are doing a gradual decline. I am concerned that we've never really gotten to a low case rate. We're still sitting around 1,000 new cases a day in Oregon. Soon, five to 12 year olds can be vaccinated. We know there will be division over this. It'll be about a third and a third and a third. A third of us will want our children vaccinated. You can just figure out the rest. So now here we are. Let's get together. Let's solve these problems. We know how to deal with the pandemic. Let's move ahead and do the business of the county. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else, Mary? Chair, that's the end of my list. The end of your list. Oh, thank you very much. Um, that's the end of our public testimony today. Gary, can you introduce the next item on the list? Yes, Chair Smith, that's me, County Administrator Update. I always like to share good news of what's going on here at Clackamas County. Today I want to share with you that the staff of our Clackamas uh, Urgent Mental Health Walk-In Center received an outstanding note from a resident that I'd like to share. This person wrote, I wanted to give some feedback regarding the center. What a great gift to the community. We, ha we have a young adult friend struggling with mental health issues who had never seen a counselor in her life but the experience for her was life-changing. We walked in around 11 a.m., and by noon, she was sitting with a skilled professional and making a game plan on how to get, a, get to a good place. The amazing and courteous receptionist, the therapist, the cleanliness, all A+. When the community needs an immediate crisis center, we have it. So thank you to the resident who wrote this note. Thank you to the staff of our urgent mental health walk-in center. And this is part of our Behavioral Health Division of Health, Housing, and Human Services. So thank you to Mary Rumbaugh, the director of that division, and her staff for outstanding service. Next, the North Clackamas Chamber of Commerce have announced their 2021 Women in Leadership and Management Award recipients. These awards recognize women in Clackamas County for their achievements as executives and leaders within our county. Commissioner Schrader uh, and County Operating Officer Nancy Bush both received an award last year from this uh, group. This year, two county employees are receiving awards, and they are uh, both from Water Environment Services. Lynn Chacoin, who is the Water Environment Services Capital Program Manager, and she also received another award recently, a, a Woman of the Year, you may recall, from a industry group, uh, and Shelly Perini, who you all know, who does uh, business and community outreach relations for Water Environment Services. Both of them will be receiving an award. Lynn will get the Public Service Award, and Shelly will receive the Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, so congratulations to both Lynn and Shelly, outstanding leaders within our county organization and our county as a whole. The award ceremony is in January, and I look forward to being there with all of you to recognize these employees. That's my update. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Gary. I'm really happy we have two county employees. In addition to our two county employees we had last year on the list. Um, I'm going to go out of order. Commissioner Fisher has to leave for a very important meeting. You are up. Thank you, Chair Smith. I really appreciate that accommodation. I, um, it's been a very busy week, lots going on, and there's a couple of things I wanted to share that really touched me this week with like, wow, we are so awesome here in Clackamas County. I'm gonna ask Mary just to put up a, a little visual for us here. There is a, a coordination group that meets in Clackamas County of a lot of different providers and our staff gave a presentation about a concept called diversion and it is to divert people out of homelessness through really great um, connection at the point of entry through what is called the CHAW which is our housing access line where people call. And I just wanted to mention this because they gave a quick presentation about um, that was inspired from the Cleveland Mediation Center and the points of contact with people, just problem solving and the level of success that happens. So if you look at the graphic there, the highway to housing and the cell phone, which you might not be able to see, is our coordinated housing access line. When people call and they're at one point in the graph, having the interventions at that very first point with excellent skilled staff, our staff connecting and problem solving 
to really do diversion from homelessness, very successful, really inspiring, and also was really encouraging is at the end of the presentation with this pro these providers, they had all opted into wanting a fuller two-day training to go deeper and to do more important work on, on that prevention. So I wanted to share that. And then a couple other things, Commissioner Schrader, and I had the um, honor and privilege of participating with a child care for all kickoff meeting, which happened, gosh, was that Wednesday or Tuesday? I think it was Tuesday, because that was our long, our long day. There was some really wonderful conversation about, you know, what is our vision? What is our guidepost? What is our, our North Star when we look at what our community needs? We're in breakout groups to really talk about what is needed at the local level. There were well over 50 people from our community that were on this call, uh, the Zoom um, event. And I like how the community is coming together around this with the support of a lot of folks in workforce. And Commissioner Schrader, I just so appreciate all that you have done in guiding this as a strong voice for not only our families, but our employers and our entire community. So my important meeting today, which is happening at 11, is with the National Association of Counties, really focusing on this issue. And as I chair the um, Education, Children and Families Subcommittee, we are looking at what is our voice in coordination with Commissioner Schrader, who works on the workforce economic development side for our nation, really looking at this very critical issue that will help us with our recovery. If we don't have safe children safe and cared for where families feel comfortable, we will not recover. I was also on a call this morning with providers that deal with youth in our community and they were talking about the challenges of our child abuse reporting system. Some providers, teachers, nonprofits are mandatory reporters. It could be us if we had observed child abuse firsthand. Are on hold with the crisis line or the child abuse hotline for um, sometimes an hour and a half. And that is not acceptable. So between that meeting and this meeting, I got on the phone with um, Representative Neron, former teacher. I call her the champion of all things children and families. And I said, hey, are you aware that this is happening? And she said, no. So Kimberly DeSantis is looking at um, connecting up so we can at least reach out with the um, Department of Human Services to say, look, this is a real problem. We can't keep our teachers, our nonprofits, our, our mandatory reporters on hold for an hour and a half to make a child abuse report. We knew that when the pandemic hit, child abuse reports went way down, law enforcement for domestic violence and child abuse went up, and now children are back at school, they're being in the environments where there can be prevention, we have got to be there as a system to support these children. So working on that, more news to come. This is just something that I wanted everyone to be aware of. And Chair Smith, thank you so much for letting me go out of order today. You bet. Go forth and conquer. Up next, Commissioner Savas. Yeah, thank you. I um, wanted to talk a little bit about what's coming up on Wednesday, which is our land use hearing. and. Um, it's land use hearing on uh, considering um, housing density um, and parking changes uh, along the C3 corridors, McLaughlin, 82nd Avenue, and others. And, um, you know, recently there's, you know, been a number of activities around the region, um, especially here in Clackamas County that I've noted, um, about how we apply, where we apply, what we do. And it's been often sometimes criticized. It's really not coordinated. And uh, we've got a, um, a group called the Clackamas County Coordinating Committee that has not really been perhaps as engaged in the coordination with the cities um, as, it should, as, as it should be. Um, granted, we have a lot on our plate and there's very little time. But goal 10, one of, the nine, one of the 19 state planning goals, specifically assigns um, the cities to be <coughs> responsible for accommodating, doing housing assessments and accommodating the housing needs in the region as they are considered or consider themselves to be the ultimate uh, uh, service providers. 
it just seems odd that as these cities continue to grow, um, that um, they're not taking some of these um, aspects um, as seriously as I think they should. And um, the county finds itself in a means of trying to be some interim city provider, which has really resulted in maybe some of the unincorporated areas feeling some of the pain, if you will, or as some people refer to over the years, as the dumping grounds for maybe what others, other areas don't want, uh, happen to be the recipients of. And um, the unfortunate aspect of this is that we have a lot of services that are really not up to par and frankly don't accommodate the needs today, let alone the needs of increased density tomorrow. Um, I'm just going to name a few, um, you know, one that is top of mind. Um, and actually one of them was in our consent agenda for the city of Happy Valley, um, notably, and that is stormwater. Um, big issue for a lot of areas. We have areas in Clackamas County that flood um, in heavy rains pretty consistently. Um, and that's not in any particular area in unincorporated, but primarily uh, in the north part, uh, north urbanized part of the county. Um, we have transportation deficiencies. Uh, we have tremendous transit deficiencies. We have parking deficiencies. Um, safety for pedestrians, schools, kids, going back and forth to schools. We have deficiencies in employment lands. Um, we are talking on Wednesday about growing our housing, but we're not doing a lot as far as coordinating on growing our employment. And really that means that, you know, if, if we don't keep balance either here in the county or regionally, um, that really results in more unemployment perhaps and probably, you know, adding to the growing um, uh, levels of poverty, which seem to be showing up on the streets. We're, we're seeing what's happening as far as that because people are being displaced. Um, on June 22nd, this board, um, after three years of advocating, finally got a presentation on, on displacement. And displacement's a complicated um, matter. But it really is about um, what policies, not dollars, but what policies can do or how they contribute to the cost of living, which results in homelessness, um, or people being moved from one area because they can no longer afford the rents. So the concerns are, how do we grow and grow affordably? And I don't mean necessarily subsidized housing, but how can young families, how can people continue to live um, with the income they have and be able to afford to live really where they grew up, uh, where they went to school, you know, in the same neighborhood they've always grown up with because when they become priced out, a lot of you are receiving your tax statements, um, you know, this month. And, um, you know, I'm hearing some comments about the increase in taxes, and uh, rightfully so. Uh, but these things really um, compound, really, um, the problems. I don't think people that live, for example, in, in rentals, uh, they don't see the property tax bill. They don't realize when they vote that perhaps they're voting for something that really results in their landlord increasing the rents because they somehow have to cover the cost for the increased taxes. Um, so th those, are, those are a few of the things that we need to be, I think we need to be more mindful, and I think it's really up to the county and the county board of commissioners to think about things more holistically, think about it at a greater, the greater service levels out there, and be more holistic about how we approach all of these, and make sure that our cities are pulling their weight, most especially as, as spelled out in Goal 10. So um, I, I'm just encouraging my, my uh, colleagues to be very thoughtful about what we do on Wednesday or how we do it and the timing of what we do. And I would certainly like to, um, as I've had more conversations from people watching the first hearing, by the way, this is why I'm kind of responding to this, um, that what are we doing to accommodate those deficiencies? Um, it seems that if we continue to um, grow the housing without growing the employment lands, that's a recipe for poverty. If we continue to to uh, grow the housing in a way that becomes less affordable, that, that, incre that increases homelessness. Um, if we continue to grow the housing and the people and not make the transit and the transportation improvements, that grows congestion. These are all things that are top of mind. Um, and you know, add to that the concept of tolling and then further adding to the cost of living, surviving, going back and forth to work. If you don't have an option to take transit because your employer is in another county because your county is not offering local employment. Um, that's a burden, uh, it's a trap. It's basically an essential trap, so to speak. 
you're either forced to pay for something that you really shouldn't pay, be paying for to some degree, um, when really it's the responsibility of, our, of, of your elected leaders, whether state, county, or others, and cities, to make sure that they accommodate and make sure that your life and your quality of life is affordable and not impacted. So, you know, I, I, I am a big believer, and I've said it for years, our quality of life should be, be goal number one, and how we approach it should be evident, and I don't think it really is clearly evident. Those are my comments for today. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is Commissioner Scholl. Yes, good morning, Clackamas County, and thank you to our speakers this morning and to our callers. On economic development, uh, thank you to the Clackamas County Economic Development Commission for a, an informative meeting Wednesday morning. The mission of the commission is to create prosperity by fostering balanced economic development in Clackamas County through a close partnership with government and the private sector. And you can see the schedule for meetings and learn more about the Clackamas County Economic Development Commission at clackamas.us business. On supportive housing, I'd like to thank the Clackamas County Housing Authority and Chair Ann Leenstra for the tour yesterday at the grand opening of the Hillside Manor housing on Southeast Hillside Court in Milwaukee. The building rehab included a total systems rehab and now provides newly remodeled public spaces and 100 affordable apartments in a beautiful new community atmosphere. It is one step in helping to relieve the effects of the high cost of housing and the housing shortage in the county. Also, thank you Milwaukee City Council and Walls Construction for your efforts in making this project a su success. On mental health, I'd like to thank Deborah Cockrell from the H3S for an update on telehealth and telepsychiatry. You might recall a couple weeks ago we had telepsychiatry on the consent agenda and some folks in the county had questions about that. Uh, Clackamas County Mental Health Clinic's telehealth program connects people with the care they need wherever they are using a sophisticated state-of-the-art technology. Mental health staff can consult, diagnose, and treat patients virtually in real time, no matter where they're located. See the website for a non-emergency number or call the 24-7 hotline, 503-655-8585. They can help you and your children, people of all ages. The incidence of mental health problems arising even among our kids. So if you have a loved one who needs counseling, do not hesitate to call, please. On opioids and addiction, our county is experiencing a serious problem with opioids. If you know somebody whose life is being ruined by opioids or any other destructive drug, start by visiting the Clackamas.us public health page on opioid safety. Nip the problem in the bud and stop this as early as possible. April Heron at 503-743, excuse me, 503-743-5300 can answer any questions you might have on this. We must stop this problem and we must stop it now. On homelessness, the county has many places that can help relieve suffering from the homeless just to mention a few, Clackamas Service Center on 82nd, the Father's Heart Day Shelter in Oregon City, Northwest Housing Alternatives in Milwaukee, Clackamas Women's Services in Oregon City, and there's many churches also that are working to relieve the suffering of homelessness. For those uh, who are in housing crisis in the county and don't know where to turn, Start by contacting the Clackamas County Coordinated Housing Access Line or online website or call 503-655-8575. Uh, also look at the Homeless Shelters Directory online. In as much as it is possible, we need to ensure everyone is safe and secure, especially as we approach a period of colder temperatures. And on warming uh, centers, 
See the Clackamas.us relief website or check your city website and you'll find contact numbers, locations, and information uh, about warming shelters and even uh, information about transportation. And one reminder on tolling, uh, please don't forget to visit the ODOT website and the Vehicle Transportation Alliance on Facebook. Be informed and be involved in this tolling discussion. On 1 December at 5.30 p.m., we're going to have a town hall, and I encourage everybody to be on that Zoom town hall. And finally, there's something very spooky <laughs> about Oregon. <laughs> Did you know that Oregon has the most ghost towns of any state in the nation. We have over 200 ghost towns. I tell you this, keep it in mind when you go outside on Halloween. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Schull. Up next, Commissioner Schrader. Well, thank you for that, Commissioner Schull. Um, I didn't know when we were t number one in ghost towns. Scary. Pretty cool stuff, so happy Halloween, everybody, before the fact. Um, I wanted to mention a few things that were on our consent agenda today because I think it's extremely important. Uh, for one thing, uh, Impact Northwest is a uh, nonprofit that works with youth and family services, housing and safety net services, and early childhood, and I want folks to note that on our consent agenda, uh, that is part of our supportive housing services, wraparound services that we are implementing. Uh, and also, let me mention Central City Concern. Uh, we are giving them dollars actually to lease a site here in Clackamas County. Uh, one of the reasons we work with them is because of their LEAD program, L-E-A-D. And I'm going to pull up a little bit just to remind myself what that is. Essentially what they do, they work at the nexus of substance use, homelessness, and criminality to disrupt that pattern. So once again, they are one of the key nonprofits that we are working with here for people who are experiencing homelessness, entrance into the criminal justice system, to make sure that they're getting the services they need and that the housing that they, we hope that we can eventually uh, move them towards. So those are two of the big things that we did this week, and I want to make note of them. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is the meetings that we had with the Willamette Falls Locks the other day. Uh, I did uh, very happily put forward Commissioner Smith's name, or Chair Smith's name, uh, to be on the Willamette Falls Locks Authority. I have served on the commission. I will con continue to serve on the commission until we disband. But right now, we are working to pull together um, names to put forward to the governor so we can have a governing body for the Lambert Falls Lock. So I'm very happy I could do that, Chair. Thank you. Um, I think that's an Thank excellent you. idea. The other person who was put forward who I think is extremely talented and a good friend is uh, Councillor Christine Lewis from Metro. And uh, Councillor Lewis right now is going to be taking over the chairmanship of the Locks Committee. I will continue to serve on that committee until the authority is formed. But I was very, very glad to see her move into that role as well. So we're going to have folks uh, with the Locks Authority who have a lot of institutional memory and really believe in, um, believe in moving this, this project forward. So, Mr. S Chair Smith, I'm glad I could do that for you. I appreciate that um, a lot. Uh, well, you know, you did a lot of work on this as well. So one of the things we do as commissioners is that we share interests and we share uh, a mission. And speaking of which, which I know that uh, Commissioner Fisher mentioned childcare. I've been a long advocate of uh, P3, uh, preschool through <laughs> three years old and older and after school programs, uh, largely because I believe that they are extremely preventative in terms of having problems later. 
in life, and particularly with brain development in young children, you know, up to about three is when a lot of that really significant development happens and, of course, con continues to happen. So I have been a real advocate of early child care. Uh, and it is not only because of uh, the fact that it's good for the children as well. One of the things that we are finding out at the national level, uh, it is also considered to be an economic driver because parents cannot go back to work. They can't prosper, uh, indeed, if they don't have adequate child care. And just a personal note on that, I got a call from my daughter, who is a prosecutor. Uh, both she and her husband had trial preparations last week. And I got a pretty panicked call with a daughter in tears because her little boy was sick and could not go to child care. And there was a few, few hours there when I thought I might have to um, head out and uh, try and manage my commission duties as well as babysitting <laughs> to close to two-year-old. However, um, I just want to thank the uh, Grandpa Peter who actually stepped in to take over that role so they could continue to do their work. And they are folks who are very lucky because they have access to child care. They can afford child care. But I have to tell you, the, the, the concern, the panic, what do you do with a sick child? I can't imagine what it's like for some folks who maybe aren't as, um, oh, I don't want to use the word privilege, but, but, but really, really you're having more of a difficult time with this because trying to work with a sick child, trying to support yourself is a huge, huge deal across the nation. So one of the things we're doing at the National Association of Counties, um, we've joined the Coalition Counties for Kids, and that basically is a template of how we can use uh, new dollars that are coming in, keep our fingers crossed from the federal government, to expand child care services. It's a template. Uh, it is a national movement, and I'm glad our county is one of the counties participating in that. In that. Finally, MPAC had a meeting last night, and uh, it was kind of interesting because um, we may actually have to vote on something and make a decision rather than just have it be informational. Uh, and I think the key issue we talked about was the I-205 corridor and tolling. And I did have had an opportunity uh, to present our perspective that we have a high level of concern with traffic being diverted into neighborhoods that are ill-equipped to handle the diversion and that uh, also the equity issue with tolling. I mean, people can't, can they afford it? Um, how are they going to kind of balance that piece of it, and so I was a voice at the table for the county at MPAC saying that we have serious concerns about tolling. And thank you, Commissioner Savas, for all your hard work with that uh, as well. Um, other than that, um, that's the news from Lake Oak Wobegon. Okay. Great. All right. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Schrader, and thank you for nominating me for that. We'll see how that works out. If not, I'll just continue my duties here in addition to. Um, thanks for Commissioner Shaw for bringing up that uh, commissioners attended uh, the Hillside Manor viewing after the remodel. Um, it's taken uh, a year to, to complete, I guess, which I think months. is astounding that it only took a year. Walsh Construction uh, was the head of that, and uh, they worked very hard to keep the residents happy. I remember touring it when I was a commissioner last time around, and it's a big improvement, and uh, the residents are going to be very happy with that. Um, regarding the Oak, Oak Lodge Water District, who wants to change its name and slight governance model to the Oak Lodge Water Authority, uh, this board considered uh, the request, they brought it to us, and what we told them to do is to go out and do more grassroots groundwork and educate your people on what's happening. And I'm very glad we did that because I'm hearing from folks, and I'm explaining what the model is. I should not have to explain what the model is or any other commissioner because I believe the onus ownership is on Oak Lodge Water District. They were concerned that their water district would go away. And I said, well, no, it's going to change the name. And they're concerned that 
um, well, the water district is going to go away then if you change our name. And, and they're not understand, <laughs> understanding, and frankly, I'm probably not the best one to explain it. Uh, we talked about stormwater runoff. I've got many concerns about that. People saying, yes, that needs to be fixed. Not that that necessarily will be fixed when and if this uh, designation happens. And there's much confusion over the Oak Lodge Water District changing their authority uh, district to an authority, people are thinking, oh, this is the beginnings of incorporating into a city. So as usual, there is misunderstanding with our public out there, and I really think it, I, it's incumbent upon those folks who are pushing this agenda to really explain it to your people what's going on out there. And I'm getting a lot of comments about that uh, moving forward. Uh, for the past three days, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, the, um, the selection of our construction firm for the courthouse has been occurring. Uh, there are three um, qualified companies who have come forward. There's been day-long meetings with one company on Tuesday, another one on Wednesday, and another one on Thursday now discussing with our staff and then our hired contract staff to help with the financing on it. Uh, Judge Steele is sitting in all day long uh, without tipping our hands to anything what we want. There's a lot of legal questions. We have an attorney going, sitting in over there. And it's uh, quite enlightening and very educating from what I understand. Every morning I come in and I give my opening remarks. I thank them for wanting to be part of Clackamas County. I thank them for um, understanding us, and, ex and my expectations are quite high for performance on this. Explaining to them that I see generational changes happening in Clackamas County, and they are part of that. And they are part of uh, replacing a courthouse built in the 1930s, and uh, it was uh, very nice to meet some of the folks over there. So with that in mind, I think that's all I have today, and this meeting is adjourned.